So I want to begin with um, some thanks and to orient you to, to the events that we are um, <coughs> gathering to enjoy tonight. Um, first of all, a number of units on campus and off campus joined the Levy Center in sponsoring this event, the Italian Cultural Institute of Los Angeles, the UCLA Center for Near Eastern <coughs> Studies, the UCLA History Department, Department of European Languages and Trans Cultural Studies, and the Center for European and Russian Studies, all at UCLA, so we're so thankful for their partnership. Um, I hope you had a chance upon entering to pick up pamphlets about some of our future events, and I hope that you will join us. And if you're not already signed up for our weekly email list, we only send you one email a week, but it is the best way to learn about our goings on. Um, the most important thanks, um, as always, goes to the staff for their incredible um, skill at carrying off events like this. Thank you to, to Vivian and Chelsea and Raina and Wu and today's additional helpers, Rebecca and Anna. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Sarah Murphy and the development team for all you've done. All right, so we are here to mark the inaugural Alfinsey Memorial Lecture and to welcome as our speaker, Dr. Emily Gribble. Um, Al was uh, a dear friend of mine. He was family to many in this room and a dear friend to many in this room. And I hope um, Dr. Gribble will be patient as I share um, the, the traditional introductory um, space between the two of them. And I want to thank, although he couldn't join us today, Alan Viterbi for helping me um, craft the introduction that follows with some key family details. So Professor Emily Grable is, is Chair of the History Department, Professor of History and of German, Russian, and East European Studies at Vanderbilt University. She has expertise, as you will see, in the history of the Balkans in Eastern Europe. Her first extraordinary book is entitled Sarajevo, 1941 to 1945, Muslims, Christians, and Jews in Hitler's Europe, which was published by Cordell in 2011. It is an extraordinary exercise of research and narration. It is based upon investigations at seven archives in three countries. The book, Sarajevo, examines the history of a city that Dr. Grable describes as, quote, a symbol of multiculturalism at its best. Sarajevo had existed under Ottoman and Habsburg rule before it became a part of Yugoslavia and, of course, before Nazi occupation. It was a place where, for so long, Judaism, Islam, and Orthodox and Catholic Christianity interlocked through the lives of its residents. Residents who were Bosnian Muslims, Orthodox Serbs, Catholic Croats, Ashkenazi and Sephardi Jews, and more. The city forged by centuries of coexistence was undone, as Dr. Grable describes in her book, during the Second World War and under, wartime, under the wartime Croatian Utasha state. And beginning in 1941, Sarajevo was remapped by ethnic cleansing, by genocide, by shifts in the identity of its multi-ethnic population. The city was also purged of its Serbs, Jews, Roma, and Sinti populations. This wonderful first book has been translated, and I know they have a multilingual population here into Italian, Turkish, and Bosnian. Might I just interrupt myself to ask how many in the room uh, were born in Sarajevo, or, or were children in Sarajevo? I know a number of you were. Lovely. Thank you. Dr. Grable's second book was published last year, and it is called Muslims in the Making of Modern Europe, and it traces the stories of several generations of local Muslim men, women, and children living in southeastern Europe from the 1880s to the 1940s. Again, an elegant book with, el with beautiful prose and ambitious research in archives in Bosnia, Macedonia, Montenegro, Croatia, and Serbia. This book, Muslims in the Making of Modern Europe, illustrates how Muslims help shape modern states and societies laws and the European project, and conversely, how Muslim histories must be understood as European histories. It won the Rothschild Harriman Book Prize and was named Best Book in History by the Financial Times in 2022, and it is being translated into Bosnian and Arabic. Now to transition us, Dr. Grable's book Sarajevo begins with portraits of four prominent Sarajevans, one each for each of the primary religious communities that called that city home. One of these figures, representing for her the Jewish community of Sarajevo, is Leon Finzi. 
Leon was the second oldest child and the eldest son of 16 children born to Rabbi Asher Finzi and Esther Baruch. His youngest brother, Joseph, was Al Finzi's father. Leon and Joseph were partners in a famous bookstore that was a cultural hub of Sarajevo, of this dynamic multicultural city, and they also lived next door to one another. Leon and his wife, Flora, had a son, Asher, who died at an early age before Al's birth, and therefore, when Joseph and Linka had their first baby, Asher, also known as Al, in the year 1929, Leon and Flora formed a special bond with their new nephew. And the UCLA Special Collections um, in the library has many photographs in the Rose and Al Finzi collection of Leon and Al together. It was in the Finzi's bookstore that Al Finzi as a child first met Rose Stock, an immigrant from Poland uh, who was to be his future wife and wife, if I'm not mistaken, of 65 years. But the war upended the teenagers and their families and their education and the cosmopolitan world they once knew. The two families, the Finzi's and the Stocks, fled to Italy and uh, their paths diverged. diverged. Al's family was interned in Italy, cared for by a local family who hid them in a vineyard. When Nazi, um, until Nazi forces advanced into Italy, the family fled again to Switzerland, crossing the Alps on foot in the middle of the night. Rose, meanwhile, with her family, suffered internment on the island of Rab and joined the Yugoslavian resistance. And the pair, Al and Rose, would meet again after the war's end in a displaced persons camp on Santa Maria de Varni, where their families became friends. In 1947, the families went together to Rome for schooling and to seek exit papers. And again, these, these two young people parted. Rose's family departed for New York, Al's to Los Angeles in the City of Angels. Al earned a high school diploma and a draft letter from the US Army. He might have served in Korea, but his native language of Serbo-Croatian allowed him to serve in the intelligence personnel at the Army Language School in Monterey. And here it seems fate intervened because stationed in Fort Meade, Maryland, in his training, Al was stunned to encounter Rose's brother, Joe. And so the path of these two families, the Stocks and the Finzies, again converged. Al returned to LA after the war, enrolled in UCLA with the support of the GI Bill. He completed his degree in three years. He graduated in 1956 with highest honors, <coughs> earned induction in Phi Beta Kappa. And soon after, Rose and Al were married. They had three children, Jeff, uh, excuse me, Joe, Jeff, and Helen. Um, Al became an accountant and um, a, a partner at his, at his company. And in Los Angeles, Rose and Al cultivated lifelong friends with other Jewish emigrants, including Andrew Viterbi, husband to Al's beloved sister, Erna, as well as Sam and Gertrude Gertie uh, Getz, through whom Al and Rose became involved with the Center for Jewish Studies at UCLA. And from that point on, Al and Rose, as well as Andrew, Viterbi, and Erna, were incredible friends and supporters of this Center for Jewish Studies. Over many decades, Rose and Al played a significant role in the growth of this center. Al served as chair of our community board for, I think, 12, uh, 11 years, if I'm not mistaken. He was a founding member of UCLA Sephardic Archive Initiative Committee Advisory Board, which um, happily launched a digital exhibit on Alan Rose's history um, in, I believe, January 2020, when we were all able to gather <coughs> together. COVID dates are a little hard to read. Maybe it was January 2019. Um, we, I think, are all braced for Al to walk through the door because there is nothing he would have loved more than Emily's lecture. But um, may his memory be for a lesson. He passed away in 2020 and we initiated um, an attempt to create a lecture series in his honor. And I want to thank our lead donors, especially Alan, Karen Viterbi, Andrew Viterbi, Rose Fincy, Alan Rose's children, uh, many other friends uh, and admirers who I know are seated in this room who endowed this fund, creating a permanent lecture fund in Al's name to be a part of the Levy Center programming. I am truly delighted and moved by your support and so happy to welcome you here tonight. So having abused my right to the podium, I will say that I can think of no more fitting scholar to inaugurate 
this lecture series than Dr. Emily Grable. We welcome her to the podium, and she will speak on the topic, a Sarajevo story, Jews, Muslims, and the complexities of rescue in a former Ottoman town. Thank you all so much for being here. It is a genuine pleasure to be invited to speak today and to do so in person. <laughs> Um, it's also a pleasure to talk about Sarajevo uh, in World War II. This is a city that is dear to me, whose history has inspired a lot of my research, both on the first and second books. Um, and it's an honor to be here with the Fincy family. Uh, I was telling someone as we were in the ha reception area that when I first showed up in Sarajevo in 2003, um, I was 24, 25 years old. And I spoke a bit of Bosnian or Croatian. I read it well. I knew I could work with documents. I didn't know quite what to do. So I went to Parliament and I knocked on the door of Jakob Finzi and I asked him for help. And he kind of looked at me and thought, who is this crazy American woman? But he did. And he helped me and he connected me with people in the city and resources. And, um, and one of the first things I then came across were documents related to Leon Finzi, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so I want to thank UCLA for hosting me, for the Levy Center, for Sarah's invitation, and especially for Chelsea White, who organized this trip twice. I was supposed to come in February, and it didn't work out because my children got COVID. Um, so I am here, and I am really grateful, and, and to the Finzi family for your support of ongoing scholarship um, in this region. So. <coughs> As I was finishing my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation in 2007, which would become the basis of my first book, Sarajevo in 1941-45, I was shocked to open the New Yorker and discover a feature article on Sarajevo during World War II, the same topic of my research. Now the piece was a non-fiction <laughs> teaser by novelist Geraldine Brooks in advance of her now best-selling historical fiction, People of the Book. In her novel, Brooks uh, traces the five-century journey of the Sarajevo Haggadah, the famous illustrated Sephardic religious text, which was created in medieval Spain and made its way after the Jewish expulsions of, nine, of 1492 across Spain, Italy, Dalmatia, and the Adriatic coast, and into Sarajevo, where it remained ever since. Now, the New Yorker piece explains that the Haggadah survived the Second World War because a Muslim curator in Bosnia, a man by the name of Dervish Korkut, had hidden it from the Nazis who had occupied Sarajevo and hoped to send the book to Hitler as a gift. So in addition to discussing how the Haggadah survived the war in hiding, Brooks also drew attention to the ways that the same Muslim curator hid a Jewish woman slated for deportation during the Holocaust. And in a sort of perfect, uplifting, finishing touch that we would expect from a New Yorker piece, um, she concludes by drawing attention to how one of Korkut's descendants would be rescued from Kosovo in 1999 by Israelis, greeted at the airport in Tel Aviv by the son of the same Sarajevo Jewish woman her father had saved a half century before. So Brooks' account is an absolutely beautiful story that reminds readers of histories of Muslims and Jewish friendship, neighborliness, and support. A Muslim had saved the Haggadah from Hitler, Muslims saved Jews from genocide, Israelis saved Muslims in the wake of mass violence and ethnic cleansing in Bosnia and, Bosnia and Kosovo. Who wouldn't love this story? At a time when tensions and conflict in Israel and Palestine were regularly hitting the front page of our newspapers, and when anti-Semitism and Islamophobia were sort of raging around the world, these kinds of stories of Muslim-Jewish friendship and rescue are healing. The stories also serve as an important counterpart to other salient narratives that were circulating at the same time that were drawing upon sort of heightened political and ideological divides that were pitting Muslims and Jews against one another. So here are three books that were coming out around the same time. Often these divisive narratives highlight Muslim collaboration with the Nazis during World War II, especially in Bosnia, and they connect these historical narratives to contemporary <coughs> polemical positions surrounding the Israel-Palestine conflict. And I just draw your attention to the middle photograph, which is 
a book called Nazi Palestine, but the photograph is actually of Bosnian Muslims, which sort of demonstrates how this story was being kind of manipulated and used in other forms of representation. Here's the original photograph with its caption. So most famous among these collaboration narratives is the story of the Bosnian Muslim Waffen SS unit, which was created in 1943 by Heinrich Himmler, and which was supported by the Mufti of Palestine, Amin al-Husseini, who visited Bosnia and Herzegovina and helped recruit soldiers for the unit. So what we have here are these conflicting images of Bosnia and of Muslims and Jews from Bosnia during the Holocaust. Right? Sarajevo is at one point remembered as a place of rescue, and on the other hand, it's also remembered as a place of Nazi collaboration. So in reality, it was both of these stories, and it was also much more complex than either one. And I knew this because I had spent over a year reading through the robust document collections detailing Sarajevo's experience during the war. Here's me in my archive. <laughs> Long before masks were popular, I wore one. And I nevertheless contracted a certain form of bacteria that one American doctor told me had not been seen since World War II. <laughs> so I had worked in a lot of different archives. I worked in the city archives, the museum archives, the secret police archives, the Gestapo's archives, the archives of the partisan resistance army, and many other institutions that make a city tick, courts, theaters, migration services, the Office of Property Expropriation, the Office of Health and Hygiene, records of humanitarian societies, and also for the records from the unit that was responsible for securing potatoes during the war, which had accidentally become the place where all records of Jewish conversions to Islam and Catholicism were dumped. I'll get back to that in a minute. So I then spent two years of my life carefully piecing together thousands of notes from these documents. I'm an old-fashioned historian. I take my notes by hand and then copy them. I cut them with paper. I put them on the floor of the house. And I piece them together to try to craft the story that became my first book. And what I realized as I was reading this New Yorker article was it wasn't that this beautifully written story was wrong or that Muslims did not save Jews or Jewish religious objects. But aspects of the story were misleading, and much of it was incomplete. For instance, I knew from reading Nazi secret police reports, alongside internal correspondence of the museum where the Haggadah had been stored, um, was that the man investigated by the Gestapo and accused of stealing it, and also fired from his position for undermining the Nazis, was a Catholic Croat. His letters asking for his job back reveal something about the man that he understood himself to be a professional, and that he was a Sarajevo patriot above all else. The Haggadah, to his mind, belonged to the city of Sarajevo. He was mad that these foreign Nazis thought they could walk in, take it, send it to Germany. So the protection of Jewish culture was not sort of the primary impetus in his own sort of telling of that story. There's the museum. I also knew that Dervish Korkut, the Muslim curator who's gone down, rightfully in history, for saving the Haggadah, was a deeply respected Islamic scholar and conservative Muslim, a man who had been in arranged marriage, who was an expert in and supported the maintenance of a society grounded in Sharia law and ethics. He also worked as an employee of the local fascist government. In fact, as an Islamic expert and deeply respected community member, he would be tapped to serve on a committee that clarified and reinterpreted Nazi racial laws for Roma in Bosnia-Herzegovina, a position that required he accept and then seek to find a workaround for Nazi racial ideas, which he would do to protect Muslims. And I'll return to this a little bit later in the talk. So what this all was telling me is that Sarajevo's wartime experience and the Haggadah's rescue did not unfold in a vacuum. It unfolded in a particular post-Ottoman framework. Historians might want to try to put it into a box of Holocaust histories or Nazi histories or World War II um, to fit it into these categories we use, like collaboration and resistance and rescue. <laughs> 
But these categories were often being derived from narratives coming from elsewhere, from Poland, from Germany, from Hungary, from Ukraine. Post-Ottoman cities had their own distinct narrative. The Sarajevo story that I knew was about loss and trauma in a city with deeply rooted religious communities with shared histories. It was about Sephardic Jews who converted to Islam on the eve of deportation, such as a wrenching case of a woman named Rosa, whose fiance, a man named Jamal, pleaded with the Raisul Ulema, the head of the Islamic community, to intervene to save his beloved. That was the first time I ever wept in an archive reading those, those accounts. The story I knew was also about conservative, traditional, patriarchal Islamic cultures and Islamic scholars of whom Korkut shared a milieu, who actually spearheaded an Islamist movement grounded in Islamic ethical norms and laws that would simultaneously denounce racial laws and state-perpetrated violence and also seek an alliance with the Nazis. I address this, uh, well, these are some images of interwar Sarajevo. I address this in my recent book, as Dr. Stein mentioned, uh, Muslims in the Making of Modern Europe. The story I knew was also about Leon Finzi, the vice president of the Sephardic Jewish Society, La Benevolencia, Al's uncle, who knew intimately this deep history and wrote a heartfelt public letter with the local rabbi to his Muslim neighbors on the eve of Nazi invasion in 1941, begging them to retract an anti-Semitic statement they had published to stop the Jews. That was their words. Finzi's letter called on his Muslim neighbors to remember that theirs was a long shared history grounded in well-known religious moral customs of the town. <clears throat> I thought it would be appropriate to sort of start thinking from Finzi's own words about some of the ways that narratives about Muslim-Jewish relations and the question of rescue occurred in wartime Sarajevo. Finzi was not calling just on an abstract, secular notion of multiculturalism. He was not just asking his Muslim neighbors to be good people. He referred specifically to the region's deeply rooted confessional structures and ethical norms that guided the way the majority of citizens lived their lives. Racial violence was foreign to these older communities' understandings of this place and of this society where they lived. It was being imposed, he felt, by external ideologies. Could they not look inward and resolve misunderstandings or disagreements in their own local way. So to understand how he got to this place and how the city got to this place in 1941, I want to very briefly just give you kind of an overview right, of, of the evolution of Sarajevo. So for centuries, Sarajevo was part of Ottoman Bosnia, uh, a town where Muslims, Catholics, Sephardic Jews, and Orthodox Christians lived together. Ashkenazim would arrive a little later. During the Ottoman period, the confessional communities shared public spaces, uh, in the bazaars, economic relations. Um, in the late Ottoman period, they also began to work together on a municipal council, a legacy that continued until 1941. So every municipal government had at least one seat reserved for one member of each of the four major religious communities. Each confessional community also had its own legal structures, court system, and social norms. People lived largely separately in their private lives. In 1878, the Habsburgs absorbed Sarajevo during the occupation of Bosnia-Herzegovina. This is a gross generalization, but the Habsburg period was relatively stable for both Muslims and Jews. There were some conflicts over values, laws, the new uh, kind of constraints of, of citizenship. There were debates over conversions to Catholicism because the Catholic Church used that as a moment to try to get more converts. There were some nationalist movements, most famously the one that will erupt in 1914 with the assassination in Sarajevo. But overwhelmingly, the Habsburg era offered the city some stability. It doesn't always get that, that reputation, and I'm happy to answer more questions on that. Um, it was a period of urbanization, modernization, the development of mass politics, new literacy campaigns. It was also a time when the demographics of the city transformed. More Christians moved into the town, and so did a significant community of Ashkenazi Jews. 
They remained mostly separate from the Sephardim in the earlier period, uh, with very limited intermarriage, and a new synagogue was built to accommodate them. In 1918, Sarajevo became part of the new state of Yugoslavia, which would exist until the Nazi occupation of 1941. Now, Yugoslavia was designed as a nation state for South Slavs, a category that was not religious specific, which meant that it was open to South Slavic speakers of all faiths, including Muslims and Jews. Now, at the same time, there were a lot of questions about what role Muslims and Jews would play in this. Were they national minorities? Were they religious minorities? What did it mean to be a minority, but also a member of the national majority? These kinds of debates played out throughout the interwar period. In many formerly Ottoman towns in Yugoslavia, such as Sarajevo, but also Novi Pazar, Monastir, which would become Vitola, um, Tuzla, Representatives from Muslims and Jewish, Muslim and Jewish communities continued to serve in municipal councils and other civic bodies. They also continued to convene in markets and public spaces, such, such as theaters and museums. So whereas some other countries after World War I had population transfers or sort of large-scale migration of minority communities, in Yugoslavia, Muslims and Jews remained. Now, overwhelmingly in their social lives, confessional communities continued to remain largely separate. Matters of family, inheritance, education, and property laws continued to be confessionally differentiated. Muslims tended to marry Muslims. Jews tended to marry Jews. Even within those categories, Slavic-speaking Muslims tended to marry Slavic-speaking Muslims and not Romani Muslims. Sephardic Jews tended to marry Sephardic Jews and not Ashkenazi Jews. There's always exceptions, but sort of the general ethic was kind of communities remained separate in their private lives. Um, women could convert to Islam to marry a Muslim man, but Muslims could not legally convert to other faiths in accordance with Sharia law, which the first constitution of Yugoslavia enshrined in 1921. Now, there were a lot of changes in the 1920s and 1930s, both locally in Sarajevo and also internationally. And these changes, I think, are essential for understanding how we get to the stories that I opened with. A conservative Islamic legal scholar hiding the Haggadah and also hiding a Jewish woman, while his Muslim neighbors are writing anti-Semitic petitions and later signing up to fight for a Waffen SS. So when Yugoslavia was founded in 1918, Muslims made up about 15% of the total population. Um, as a community, they had experienced a lot of change in the 19th and 20th centuries, um, and particularly experiencing sort of widespread discrimination and loss of prestige, property, political, and economic influence with the start of Yugoslavia. Throughout the 1920s, Muslims across Yugoslavia grew angry about discrimination in the workplace, the economy, and in politics. They grew angry about secularization laws and policies, especially in schools and courts. And they thought that the new state was seeking to displace Islamic cultures and institutions with a distinct Christian bias. They were also angry about nationalist cultural campaigns that depicted Muslims as inferior, backwards, and foreign to new national cultures and modern European social norms. Now, their experience in the 1920s is not that uncommon from the experience of other minority communities in nationalizing states. Jews experienced similar marginalization and discrimination in many places. We've got some wonderful new books on sort of Jewish communities in Poland, for example, that are experiencing many of the same things, also in Romania. But the two communities rarely put these concerns in dialogue with one another in Yugoslavia. That doesn't mean they were both not critical of the same things. In 1931, for example, Yugoslav Muslims voiced resistance to the secularization of the state's family law code. So did Jews. When the Yugoslav state sought to intervene in divorce laws, rabbis fought back, seeking to keep divorce within the Beit Din. But instead of synergies, the two communities grew increasingly apart throughout the 1930s, with Muslim townsmen increasingly associating their Jewish neighbors with broader threats to their way of life. Now, Within this system, uh, Muslims started to organize movements 
in which they sought to combat what they saw as their marginalization within Yugoslav society. They felt like they were losing a sense of what made them a community and that their faith was being watered down through the modern, secularizing, nationalizing state. They started to look for different solutions. In 1929, new movements, typically described as revivalist or Islamist or traditionalist, started to take root in Yugoslavia. The Mufti of Tuzla, a man by the name of Ibrahim Haki Chokic, was an early leader of this movement, and he tried to capture the ideas of what was attracting Muslims to these new ways of political thinking. He described the dangers of Yugoslavia's secularizing culture and Muslims' absorption of modern lifestyles. They wanted to strengthen the institutions of Sharia law and Islamic customary norms. They wanted to return to a period of segregated schools and the veiling of Muslim women. They looked to Islamic legal revivalist ideas that were coming out of the Middle East, commonly associated with Salafism or the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, in rethinking how Muslims might engage with modernity and the European state. The crisis, they believed, was much bigger than any one country. They needed a movement, and they needed international support. And so in the 1930s, they created one, and it became incredibly powerful and successful. Through newspapers, magazines, charitable groups, schools, and grassroots organizations, a range of Islamic activists outlined a collective manifesto that rejected the structures and ideologies of the secular state, that rebuked ideas of modernization that were leading to assimilation, mixed marriages, and also they complained of alcoholism and prostitution, sort of all society's problems were put in there. And they sought to strengthen Islamic morals and lifestyles by implementing stricter homogenous interpretations of Sharia law for Muslim masses. So this movement began as a religious fraternity of conservative Islamic scholars, teachers, and jurists, but it quickly morphed into a powerful political movement with tens of thousands of official, I'm sorry, with thousands of official followers. They had to subscribe, so we have their names, um, and also tens of thousands of unofficial ones. Some religious leaders took a cue from what was going on in Egypt and began to run for office as well in the late 1930s. And their actions foreshadowed the ways that political Islam would consolidate in the next two decades. <coughs> now this all coincides, of course, with the rise of Nazi Germany in the 1930s, the expansion and strengthening of fascist Italy, and the beginning of the Second World War. Anti-Semitism grows in Yugoslavia in the 1930s, both in Muslim communities and also in Christian communities, and it manifested in periodic boycotts of Jewish businesses, questioning of the patriotism of Jewish soldiers and citizens, quotas in schools. Some Muslims joined this uh, in perpetuating this discourse, especially when the major Jewish political party aligned with other political groups against their side, which was really more of a voting bloc issue than any kind of ideological issue, but as we all know, elections can cause community rifts. Um, events in Palestine in the 1930s also provoked tension and became used as a propaganda tool, as it seemed like the British were going to give away what they saw as historic Muslim lands to Jewish settlers in the 1930s, many Bosnian Muslims expressed anger. Critiques of Palestine often included anti-Semitic language. A small group by the late 1930s began to believe in the international Jewish conspiracy, which they also associated with European imperialism, communism, and Turkish nationalism. Um, they believed that the radical secularizing campaigns in Turkey was all part of this uh, movement. This was a very convenient moment for the Nazis to come in and seek support. They used the Palestine situation and British imperial politics in Muslim lands to actively recruit Muslims around the world. In the Middle East, they hoped such an alliance would help them beat the British and French. In the Balkans, Eastern Europe, and also in the Soviet Union, in places that are today Crimea and Chechnya, um, they drew upon shared fears of, commu uh, of communism and radical atheism to build an alliance with Muslims that they hoped would then help them beat the Soviet Red Army and push back communism. Everywhere, they promised Muslims control over Islam, schools, courts, laws, 
In the Balkans, especially in Bosnia, but also in the Italian-occupied regions of Kosovo, they responded directly to the goals of the Islamists and the anti-secular campaigns in hoping to build an alliance that would cement the Third Reich's empire in Southern Europe. So this is the situation when war breaks out in Sarajevo in April of 1941. The Nazis, Italians, and Bulgarians invade. They divide it up. They annex some parts. They occupy other parts. And they also create a new Axis ally, the independent state of Croatia, which absorbed Bosnia-Herzegovina and most of Croatia. The new state is run by a regime called the Ustasha regime, who are radical Croat nationalists. They're mostly associated historically with Catholics. They had a close relationship with the Catholic Church. But the Ustasha brand of national ideology welcomed Muslims into their project, calling them the flower of the Croat nation and arguing that Croatia was actually a nation of two faiths, Catholicism and Islam. Now, many Muslims in Bosnia were wary, but they signed on to the project anyway. What are they expecting, right? They're expecting a greater political voice in the state. They're expecting more conservative social and cultural norms that are gonna counter Yugoslavia's liberal and secularizing cultures. Most importantly, they're expecting the protection of Islam. They're imagining what I like to call confessional sovereignty and political autonomy. And their ideas are rooted in Ottoman and Habsburg understandings of how politics and can work and how communities can have autonomy within the states, not in the 20th century's political framework of mass politics that had become dominant in Yugoslavia in the 20s and 30s. Muslims who assumed political posts, and they assumed them from the level of yeah, town mayors all the way up to vice president of the Ustasha state, uh, promptly began to follow their own Islamic agenda. They sought to resegregate schools by, by gender and reestablish shuttered Islamic schools, outlaw mixed faith marriages, expand the powers of the Sharia judiciary, change the curriculum in Islamic schools. They fully expected control over Islamic institutions, the preservation of Islamic law, and the rights to define who was Muslim. So you can imagine their surprise when almost immediately the Ustasha regime began to introduce a version of the Nuremberg laws based on the Nazis' racial laws. These laws immediately made clear that racial law was more important than Islamic law. This would actually become a tension throughout the war until the last week of 1945 when the Nazis were sort of withdrawing. They were still debating this, which law was more important. Race laws set out to divide people into two groups. Aryans and non-Aryans. And just as in Nazi Germany, it was Croatia's racial laws were paired with citizenship laws. Um, and the citizenship laws were called the protection of Croatian blood and honor, which meant that Croatian citizenship could only be granted to, quote, a national member of the Aryan race. People were granted Aryan status by establishing elaborate blood requirements of racial purity, and just like in Nazi Germany, the Ustasha's legalized discrimination against all non-Aryans. They passed decrees legalizing job purges, property confiscation, social restrictions, and forced labor of anyone classified as non-Aryan. And these policies paved the way for mass imprisonment, deportation, and extermination. Now, Croatia's racial laws were a little bit different than some other countries, and that non-Aryan was formally defined in the law as Jews, Roma, and others. A very clear-cut legal category. Across the state, local administrators immediately began to ask, how can we tell who is Aryan, and who is a citizen, and who is another? What kinds of evidence is needed? What should we do with people who have no records, as is common in rural parts of the state? What about people who don't fit easily into any one of these categories? How would racial law work in a place that remains deeply defined in culture, law, and social norms along confessional lines? Now, the Ustasha didn't have all the answers to this, but they immediately recognized that there was going to be pushback. And so they start to create various kinds of new policies and legal loopholes. For example, 
they establish a provision where imams can use witness testimony instead of documentary evidence to prove a Muslim's racial background. Um, and witness testimony was grounded in previous um, forms of Ottoman law. This sets a precedent of allowing religious clergy to define the legal boundaries of their own community. They also allow Roma to be reclassified as Aryan of the Indo-Germanic race if they are Muslim. <laughs> Dervish Korkut, the man who hid the Haggadah, was part of the committee that won that provision. In one of their most controversial and famous uh, policies, the Ustasha regime allowed, and in some instances forced, Orthodox Christians to convert to Catholicism, and there were also cases of conversions to Islam of Orthodox Christians, which suggested that conversion to Islam or Catholicism was a path toward Aryan racial status and citizenship. In Sarajevo, this makes sense. Both religious and political leaders came to believe that being Catholic or Muslim de facto meant being an Aryan Croat. So what happens? In the early months of the war, 20% of Sarajevo's Jews convert to Catholicism or Islam. And this is those documents I was saying at the beginning that I came across in these unmarked boxes of potato receipts. Now, conversion had multiple steps, and it's all outlined. All right? Multiple parties were involved. First, a religious official, such as a priest or a Sharia court judge, performed the religious service and sent an affidavit to the mayor's office. The Jewish convert then had to go down and pay a, a conversion tax to the city government, which had to sign off on the conversion. Sometimes priests and judges helped Jews submit the required forms. Sometimes the mayors waived the fees, suggesting that this was, wasn't just a financial ruse. After the conversion was officially recognized in the city's books, the mayor's office would send a notification to the old and new religious community, and in the case of converts to Islam, note the person's new name. Converts could then appeal to be exempt from racial law, such as wearing the yellow star of David, or working in Jewish labor battalions. So the Nazis and the Ustashas are perplexed by these conversions. They didn't really want to rock the boat with the local Sarajevo allies, uh, but they also didn't understand what these people thought they were doing. So they started to make plans to move forward with the deportation of Jewish converts along with other people racially classified as Jews in fall of 1941. Outraged, the head of the Islamic religious community in Sarajevo, the Rais Lulima Fehim Spaho, ordered Muslim leaders, including imams, Sharia court judges, and Islamic teachers, to take all Jewish Muslims into shelter. He also personally intervened in many of these cases, using his position and prestige to buy Jews time. Although they didn't save many lives, it did create time for other Muslims to smuggle converts out or for Jewish Muslims to go into hiding. Still frustrated by this resistance, in October 1941, the Ustasha regime outlawed all new conversions intervening in the confessional practices of Islam, which seemed to many Muslims a violation of their re religious freedom and also the terms on which they had signed up to this alliance in the first place. Some imams started backdating paperwork to try to work around it, but it didn't always work. The Germans take every Jew, Fahim Smaho, Spaho lamented that fall, even those who have converted to Islam and Catholicism that is the work of the Germans, and our own government cannot intervene. There is nothing we can do about it. So Islamic scholars and religious leaders were not willing to just let the fascists arbitrarily establish ideas of who belonged and who did not to their communities. Race laws and racially motivated mass violence were in fundamental oppositions to the way that they had established the boundaries of the Islamic community, which, as we recall, was one of the primary goals throughout the 1920s and 30s and sort of the central component of the Islamic mass movement. Now, among those Muslims who personally sought to rescue or intervene on behalf of Jews, Jewish converts, and other people targeted by racial laws, 
we find many people who today we might describe as Islamist or revivalist or traditionalist. That is, people who are not motivated by a secular belief in civic citizenship and multiculturalism, nor by European ideas of human rights or liberalism, but by strong moral codes grounded in Islamic law and ethics. Um, and I love this photograph because this is a photograph of a Muslim woman um, in veil and headscarf using her hijab to hide the yellow star of the Jewish woman who she's walking down the street with. So looking at these events from 2022, we're confronted by lots of paradoxes and inconsistencies. Across Sarajevo, and actually across Bosnia, southern Serbia, Kosovo, Albania, and Macedonia, these places with deeply rooted confessional and Ottoman cultures, we find many examples of Muslims protecting Jewish friends, neighbors, and colleagues, and even strangers. We know that Muslim politicians forged documents so Jews could travel, and that people welcomed neighbors into their homes, sometimes hiding them as Muslim women behind a veil and headscarf. Hiding Jews became so commonplace across the city of Sarajevo during the deportations that the local fascist uh, officials put on the front page of the newspaper a public reprimand to the entire city for undermining Nazi policy. Bosnian Muslims also spoke out against mass violence and genocidal policies. In the fall of 1941, amid the deportations, um, a group of Muslim leaders wrote and signed a series of public resolutions that denounced Ustasha policies. They circulated them widely, read them aloud, hundreds of Muslims were involved. When reading through their names and titles, and there's a, a new book that has just come out in English that tries to put them together in translation, you see scholars, judges, teachers at madrasas, local businessmen, um, all coming together to sign these public condemnations. And it's one of those rare public condemnations of genocide during World War II. But what's overlooked by historians is that many of these same Muslims who supported these resolutions against genocide in 1941 and who in various forms protested racial legislation helped Jews and Jewish converts to Islam, also worked for the Ustasha regime and supported a stronger alliance with the Third Reich. In October of 1942, several elite Muslims in Sarajevo petitioned Adolf Hitler directly, requesting that he turn Bosnia into a Nazi protectorate. By early 1943, members of the Muslim elite in Sarajevo were working with Heinrich Himmler, head of the infamous SS, to create a Bosnian Muslim co Nazi collaboration. They drew on global Islamic connections, including the Mufti of Palestine, in a quest to try to do something differently. And in spring of 1943, they founded the Bosnian Muslim Waffen SS unit. The unit subsequently recruited Muslims from across Bosnia Herzegovina, promising them, them that they would be working in the defense of Muslim civilians caught in the crossfire of civil war, that they would be fighting against communism, and that they would be able to return Bosnia-Herzegovina to a society grounded in the morals of Islam. And no, these Muslims did not have a major ideological conversion in these three years. Their motives were consistent. Looking around them from the standpoint in wartime Bosnia, Muslim leaders felt like they had no protectors, no army in the country that would defend Muslims, no political groups that were promising them religious autonomy. The Soviet Union and its revolutionary communist agenda was understood to be vehemently anti-Muslim. The British and Americans and French all had harsh imperial uh, policies that repressed millions of Muslims in the Middle East and North Africa and South Asia, and they were reading about this all the time, because of course the newspapers are highly censored and being produced in a propagandistic way. So these recruits to the Bosnian Muslim Vatan SS not only expect that they're going to be fighting locally against communists, um, but that the, Bos the Muslim SS is going to be paired with truly Muslim rule in Bosnia. They were shocked to learn they were going to be sent to the Eastern Front immediately after signing up. Uh, they're also quite shocked to have German commanders. Many groups responded aggressively, 
One group shot their German officers in protest. <laughs> Others defected at the border as they were being deployed. Gradually, almost every single unit dissolved into rogue militias, many of which coordinated with local Muslim rebels across Croatia to form an Islamist, anti-communist Muslim resistance. Others actually joined the communists. Some soldiers found their way back home to the cities where they had come from, like Sarajevo, where I found them in the records taking part in organizations such that were trying to strengthen underground Islamic schools, cultural societies, and humanitarian initiatives. So whatever your image might have been of the Waffen SS units in World War II before this talk, I doubt many people in this room were thinking of, of a group of people who welcomed a German invasion, then fought against Nazi racial laws, helped Jews convert to Islam to escape them, then joined a, a, a Waffen SS, shot their German officers, and returned home to run soup kitchens for refugees. <laughs> this is the story of the complexity of studying and writing and thinking about World War II in post-Ottoman Europe. This is our image of, uh, of Bosnia, of Sarajevo today. So to conclude, and I, I put this little conclusion slide together because I didn't want to leave us on um, images of, uh, depressing images. These are some images of, of me and my children and my dog in Sarajevo and the area around Sarajevo over the last 20 years. Um, places we've been, this is, as I said, a city that means so much to me. Um, but I'd like to leave you with three sort of bigger concluding points. The first is that I think we see in this story of Muslim-Jewish interactions in wartime Sarajevo that existing social codes and administrative and legal practices are generally resistant to change. Islamic ethics, norms, and laws were pervasive across formerly Ottoman lands, and movements like Nazism that wanted to change these practices radically had to really work at it for a while. Sarajevo's long-standing Ottoman and confessional cultures, what Leon Finzi described on the eve of the war as the town's well-known religious moral customs, was a complex way of being. It was a society in action. It was a way of thinking about community, relations, obligations, life in this place. Now, this doesn't mean that ideological movements couldn't break in or undermine those codes. Certainly, people supported the Nazis in Sarajevo. But this was a process, and along the way, they faced unexpected challenges and many moments of reckoning. Secondly, in Sarajevo, Muslim efforts to rescue Jews and Jewish culture, as well as Muslim alliances with the radical right, were both deeply entangled in a long history of fighting for Islamic rights and preservation of Islamic legal and social norms and Muslim political power. It was part of a struggle among Muslims over how to grapple with and reassert power in the long wake of the Ottoman Empire. Finally, I think that what we learn from this story is that nothing is black and white when it came to the way to the, that people responded to the war. And we have to critically analyze and reflect on distinct historical contexts and spaces. The moral categories that historians have created to think about the war, like collaboration, resistance, and rescue, are based on certain ethical presumptions that we hold today. And there's this sense that you're in one box or another. But they don't always help us to understand how people's motives were driving their actions at the time. And I think as we, see to, we saw today, that the same people will fit into these different categories not even at different moments in the war, but at the same moment in the war. Gray areas are really important in history, and these local histories help us to understand them. This doesn't mean that we can't make ethical judgments, um, but in analyzing local motives, I think we can push, push past some of these polemical interpretations and one-sided histories and advance new ways of thinking about people with interwoven pasts. Thank you so much. <laughs>
transition here to some conversation, and um, I'm going to lead off with one question, but then we're going to open the floor for comments and questions and have a microphone circulating. And we probably have time for a handful or two. Um, so I wanted to start by thanking you for your wonderful talk and for your research. Um, but specifically in, in reviewing your work to introduce you, I was struck by the fact that your first book, in the title, Made Sarajevo the Cut Protagonist. Um, and it got me thinking about the ways in which your work really defies the way in which Jewish history has tended to imagine itself. And there are so few works that think in an integrated fashion about Jews and other believers. And you and I could, of course, brainstorm a list of people who have bucked that trend, um, ranging across Europe and the Middle East and Africa. Um, so we have precedents, and yet especially for European Jewish history, that kind of engaged history um, of a place is so rare. So I wondered if you might just speak briefly about, you think, the reasons behind that, but also the advantages of making the space the protagonist, and therefore foregrounding a different vision of um, relationships. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Okay, right. So that's an excellent question. So when I began this, this book, it was actually Sarajevo itself that had so fascinated me. Uh, I was The first time I was in Sarajevo was on 9-11, and I got stuck there. And I had not at that point thought I was, I was about to start my PhD at Stanford, but I didn't realize I was going to write about Sarajevo. And I was there, and I just found myself I'm from New York, couldn't get in touch with my father. It was a very emotional time for me. And I found myself walking around the city, and I kept coming in, I was you know, crying at different moments, or I'd suddenly be at a cafe and burst into tears. And I found myself meeting people who just had this kind of global civic spirit, and it, it sort of held, sort of stuck with me. Um, and I was fascinated by the fact, you know, physically, if you go to Sarajevo, there's all these, you know, it's just this integrated tapestry of religious communities and national communities and ethnic communities. And there was something about it that made me realize there's something in this city. And I, I played with lots of different terms, civic consciousness. Um, people there call it, a, I'm blanking on, on the term, but a sort of community collective way of, of being. And so when I began to work on this, and it did not begin as a sort of Muslim Jewish Christian story. I actually was coming at it from the sort of contemporary perspective and imagining this was going to be a more of a kind of story of a cosmopolitan city. Um, and when I got into the records is when I realized that these confessional norms were what actually was the glue holding this earlier confessional or this earlier civic consciousness together. So it was, I think, you know, the, the starting point of a city uh, allowed me to defy the nation and the national categories that get used, especially in Balkan history. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're so dominated by the history of Serbs or history of Croats. Uh, but these categories mean something different in a multi-confessional city. And so when you start with the city, it allowed me then to break out of the category. Right, there's, just like there were Muslim Jews, there were also Muslim Serbs who ended up in camps because they were you know, deported as Serbs. There were also Orthodox Christians who worked for the Ustasha regime, who were grounded in the, the, the city's culture. Uh, so this, starting with the city, I think, allowed me, and I think it can allow other people, to challenge some of the national and ideological narratives that have really kind of dominated our histories of World War II, but also a lot of the Balkans and Eastern Europe, and the Middle East, I mean, these, these regions where national categories have, have dictated the stories we tell. It seems to be also so much a question of how we <coughs> work with students to, to ask questions and to look for answers. Um, and one would have to really imagine um, a different way of, of teaching, a different kind of syllabus, a different way of training in languages to, um, to encourage the field to, up, to upset its traditional um, lines of demarcation. Yes, and I try to teach that way. Um, so I, I teach a course, for example, on Muslims in Europe, where I, you know, it's, it, you ignore states 
And so we look at Thebes and we connect, for example, you know, conversion in Bosnia and conversion in England. Or we connect stories of mosque building and madrasas in Poland, uh, which actually occurred in many Muslim Jewish uh, shtetls. There were mosques in eastern Poland. And we'll connect that to sort of narratives in France and try to sort of think through and break down our national categories to do that. Likewise, in a course on law and rights, I, I start with sort of a question of what is citizenship from a, the perspective of an enslaved Christian woman? What is, what is citizenship from the perspective of a Jewish merchant in the Ottoman Empire trying to navigate you know, these new political boundaries? Your work has been really instrumental for this. So trying to, I think, you know, encourage you, of course, you know, we all want to know what is German history and what is French history. Uh, but are those histories what we think they are? And, and I like to kind of play with those categories with, with students as well. Wonderful, thank you. So I know um, someone was possibly going to help move a mic around, but if not, I'll just ask people to stand up and speak very loudly. So what I'd like to do is invite, I think, two questions at a time, and then you can answer them both. Um, so we'll start with Rabbi Chaim in the back. So uh, one little a factual question. And then I have a, a real question. The factual question is that you said that Jewish women could convert to Islam to marry Muslim men. Now, could Jewish men convert mm -hmm. to marry Muslim women? No. Uh, I, uh, so that, that's important not to leave out. Jewish men could convert, but not to marry Muslim women. Okay. Not in that moment. Uh, I mean, so, so, there, so, so in other words, there is a built-in uh, dimension of discrimination in the system itself, uh, as, it, as it represents. The second, the second thing is a really troubling dimension, and that is that the, the stories of cooperation and neighborliness are moving and significant. But to me, the most significant thing is an alliance with the Nazis. And, and it's almost as if that was elided because of the need to demonstrate cooperation. And when compromise is made with evil, you can't do that. I, I mean, that's why I feel so strongly about that. And, and I, I, it doesn't mean that we have to go and hit people on the head. I mean, but we have to know that. And, and things result from that, including the way you behave, because you have to. That's one part of it. The second thing is the motivation is, is self-interest, power, maintaining influence. And those are dimensions, political dimensions, that are expressed and you talk and you talk about and you try to frame this as religious communities. They are political communities acting on their uh, on their interests, like all political <coughs> communities. Thank you. Shall we follow the model of two? Or it's up to you, Woody. I can answer this one. Was, sure. Uh, so you're absolutely right. This is a form, and that's why I, in the earlier part of the lecture, had this slide about political Islam. This is absolutely part of a political movement. And it's a political movement that's grounded in a certain way of thinking about the relationship and role of Islam in society and politics. Um, and I you know that one of the reasons why I end with this point of, of course, there's ethical dimensions to this. Um, as a historian, my interest is to understand and think through motive, and to think through how these narratives go together. And as I opened with, you know, throughout the early 2000s, these stories were always told as one or the other. And I think they have to be told to, together. Uh, that does not mean that you cannot think right, that this is, that the collaboration and that moment is the more powerful and important story. But I think we, to understand the latter, to understand each without understanding the other erases history and, and doesn't give us the sort of tools we need to understand what was going on and how it might have been different in a post-Ottoman city than it was in Warsaw or you know, Kiev or some other other place. Thank you so much for your comment. Thank you. Thank you for this really excellent talk. Actually, my question builds on this last question. And uh, when you talked a lot about you had the Nazi ideology or one part, and you had these personal stories. I haven't read the book yet, but I'm really looking forward to reading the book. 
you had all these personal stories that are trying to interact with this ideology. So my question relates to your interpretation of and your discussion of Shari Ali. I assume that you don't have one interpretation and version of Shari Ali. You had the Sufis, you had you talked about people who had connection with Hajj Ali Husseini, you had people who were connected to political Islam in Egypt and all the other uh, Naqshbandi orders and all these other orders within the Russian, within the Soviet, the former Soviet Union. So, if you take all of these into account, if you can break down these categories, what is Islam? Or inside, what are what are the Islams inside of it that help us understand these personal and sometimes. Um, Subjective, sometimes of interest. So, so people are really interacting to this based on their, I guess, based on these different versions of these backgrounds of how they see Islam. I, I just want to see if I'm, if I'm yeah. wrong. And I would love, and as I said, I haven't read the books. I'm really looking forward to reading the book. So, that's another wonderful question. So, just to give you some background on this talk, when, uh, when Dr. Stein invited me to speak and told me the theme, she said, you know, you can do something on your first book, you can do something on your second book, you can do something on the third project, really, you know, what, what do you want to do? And I, I gave that a lot of thought. And what I did here today was I revisited my first book in light of my second book. So this is a talk I wrote just for you. I have not published this. It's actually not in either book in this form. Um, but it draws on sort of what I learned from writing about Muslim movements that helped me rethink some of what I had written already about Sarajevo in World War II. So um, it's, it's sort of a, a, a blend of books. Um, and, and the question about Islam is, is a really important one, and it, it ha I have like five chapters on that in, um, in the new book, because there are many different ways of practicing and being Muslim. And what happens in the movement of political Islam, to go back to the previous gentleman's question, is that um, a certain form of, of a, a single interpretation starts to become dominated by political movements. So they outlaw Sufi teke, they shut down alternative ways of thinking about Islam, and it happens across the entire state. They seek to kind of repress certain forms of practicing Islam and elevate others and create kind of a streamlined approach. Um, Bosnia was one of the only countries or places, it wasn't a country, Yugoslavia was a country, but Bosnia was one of the only places where they actually um, outlawed mixed marriages at a certain point. So Muslim men were not allowed to marry outside of Islam at a certain point in the late 1930s because they were trying to protect sort of the boundaries of a Muslim community. Uh, so there are many different forms of Islam, and I think that especially the Sufi traditions Sort of plays into these ideas of kind of community, of mysticism, of cooperation, of communal living. Um, and even though the uh, sort of official Sufi uh, brotherhoods were no longer present, the kind of cultures that they had been you know, part of and sustained for hundreds of years persisted. Uh, so I think that there, it's a big question and it's, it's a complicated one. Um, but yes, there are m many forms of practicing Islam. And, Part of what's happening here, and there's actually rifts during the war where certain people who were trying to put together one kind of Islam and, and really put their agenda forward aligned with the Nazis and the others aligned with the Ustasha and then the third actually aligned with the partisans at the end of the war. And so you have these kinds of different mixes where the politics are being kind of laid out along practices of, of religion. Please, please. Two questions uh, more related to geographical and ethical uh, things. You mentioned Poland and Muslims. Did I hear it? Right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, maybe uh, you can touch on the subject a little bit. And another one is in terms of something that you mentioned about connections between Muslims of uh, former Yugoslavia and Crimean. Muslims, Tatar Muslims, and uh, Chechen Muslims, especially in lights of uh, current events. Maybe you can touch on this a little bit too. How significant was the uh, network? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to answer? 
Uh, I saw one more hand, so perhaps we'll add a second question, please. Um, I was um, wondering about the Slav part of the Muslim and the Ustashi, because first phrase that I was in Yugoslavia, we, I was taught that religions don't matter, but we are all Southern Slavs. How did the Ustashi and the Germans explain to these Muslims that uh, some of them are Aryan and some of them are not, or to the, or to the, you know, Croats were Aryan and Serbs were not. I, I'm a little confused about their laws, so that was my question. And and about the reaction, the people's reaction to that. So racial laws are arbitrary, right? and I, I think we we've seen that throughout you know our, the studies of the 20th century um, and places where they exist, and they they just establish uh, these arbitrary categories and argue that the Croat nation and the Serb nation are fundamentally different racial ideas, um, and part of what they do as with racial law is to say that it's not it doesn't really matter what one's religion is it matters what one's race is. And so therefore, Muslims who identified as Serbs um, were considered non-Aryan, and Muslims who identify as Croats are considered Aryan. And there's this fascinating case, because a number of families will sort of, they had people operating in different groups in the interwar period, because many Muslim elite families understood these categories as political. And so they have one Croat son, one Serb son, and one Yugoslav son. <laughs> So then what does that look like when you're suddenly in this system where you're trying to define sort of racial purity by blood lineage? Um, so there's, there's so many paradoxes that are built into it. To come back to your question, um, it wasn't that Muslims were connected in these different places during World War II. It was that the Germans used similar means of propaganda to speak to all of them and recruit alliances. Uh, so there was a sense of being part of a broader Islamic world and a sense that there were shared interests and shared campaigns against communism, against secularism, uh, against imperialism, uh, but the individual movements were separate. Uh, and in Poland, it's sort of a fascinating, I, fascinating story that has not been really properly analyzed or written about. Uh, but. There were groups of Tatars who were living in Belarusia, Latvia, and Eastern Poland, and they remained there. And many of them also lived in areas that were sort of on the cusp of the Pale of Settlement. And so <coughs> during World War II, there were um, certain villages where you had both Muslims and Jews who lived there together. Um, and I have not read much about it, but they, uh, they did exist. And there continue to be today Polish and Belarusian Tatars, the largest uh, Belarusian Tatar community has a mosque in uh, New York City, and they continue to celebrate different kinds of holidays. Um, and they write me, and they made a documentary film um, about their community trying to take a heritage trip back to Belarus. Um, and they're, you know, we would see them very much as just New Yorkers, <laughs> multiple <laughs> generations later. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one more hand. How do you possibly heal a society? after you have divided it into groups, set one group against the other at various points of the work, how can you possibly heal a post-war society like that? <laughs> we want to take some <laughs> I mean, you know, it's the ways that they, I can tell you how the, the communists tried to do it. Um, they tried to build new narratives of unity and brotherhood. And so the socialists, when they came in, their slogan was brotherhood and unity. They removed people who were most obviously collaborators. Uh, they also removed most of the religious leaders um, and set out to create a secular kind of civic citizenry. Uh, many people will argue that they were successful at that and socialist Yugoslavia had a secular united civic citizenry. I think the wars in the 90s uh, suggest that it wasn't as um, cohesive as certain you know, politicians wanted to make it seem. Uh, there was a lot of repression in the late 1940s. There were a lot of communities, uh, a lot of people sent to jail uh, who, you know, and removed from, from public 
um, for public society. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question in the back. So we saw in other parts of the Balkans, particularly in Albania, where large numbers of Jews were saved during uh, uh, World War II by, by Muslim people. And uh, we don't see that in Bosnia. Uh, the majority of people in Bosnia and Herzegovina were killed in Auschwitz and Bibetana. Uh, I see from many sources, including your presentation today, uh, stories on both sides that uh, some Muslims who saved Jews. And I see also this, this group of uh, SS uh, uh, people, uh, but I see the same faces. There are multi multiple presentations. I don't know the extent. Is it really those 20 people all together who uh, joined SS, but learning from you today, that is a very short-lived operation anyway. Uh, and how would you compare the numbers of uh, really in, in, in Sarajevo uh, when the, the Muslims protected Jews on one side and uh, who were very much against and then to join the S in the two extremes. And how would you calculate uh, the distribution of people during these uh, very uh, set times of history? You know, we don't have precise numbers, and I, I'm not a quantitative scholar, so I haven't actually gone through and thought about, you know, looking for the names of people. A lot of the narratives that I tell are very much about individuals. Right? There's you know, Berta, a Jewish hairdresser, who Muslims continue to see to cut her hair, their hair, even though it's you know illegal for them to do so. Um, and so there's, I am more interested, you're right, in sort of the questions of the human connections. Um, what we do know is that because the secret police were so frustrated by the sheer number of people in Sarajevo who were hiding Jews to the point where they put it on the front page of the newspaper. And we know that from the Raisul Ulema's statement where you know, he orders as a religious obligation every you know, Sharia court judge and imam to take Jewish converts into custody, that these are you know, not insignificant numbers. We're not talking about 20 people. I mean, we're talking about thousands of people. Um, and then we're also talking about thousands of people who either support or join um, or you know, work in some capacity with the Nazis, whether in the Bosnian Muslim Vapen SS um, or in a different group. Interestingly, you know, you brought up Kosovo in, in Albania, and there's also a Kosovo Albanian Vapen SS, and there's also religious leaders for Khadraga, for example, who simultaneously is working with the Italian fascists and then the Nazis, also for similar goals of sort of rebuilding madrasas and maktabs and, um, and Islamic schools that have been destroyed and, and repressed during the interwar period. Uh, but we don't have kind of the same narrative, uh, but we do know that they are much more successful in saving Jews. Uh, and the, the line of Jews that go through Kosovo and into Albania through these you know, very conservative and traditionalist Muslim communities um, is is much larger than in other places, and so it's a it's a narrative that I hope you know, somebody with Albanian uh, language skills uh, will, will will analyze and will research at some point. Um, it's controversial, right, as all of these stories are. It's easier to do that when you're a tenured you know, chair of a history department than when you're a graduate student. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And one more question. I have one question. Um, you mentioned that in all of this, you mentioned Ustasha. What about the Serbian Chetniks? What about their annihilation of Muslims in Eastern Bosnia? And that being a drive to a lot of these people to align with the Nazis. Yeah, so I didn't emphasize that part of the narrative here, but I write about it a lot um, because it just seemed like in a group of, or a public audience, this is already such a multi-dimensional and complicated story. And the Chetniks were not present in Sarajevo, really. They had a very small sort of movement um, and there were actually Muslims who supported them in later in the war, which was sort of fascinating. But many of the early resolutions and uh, anti-genocide statements con con were, were triggered by Chetnik ethnic cleansing of Muslims and the mass killing of Muslims in other parts of the region. So there was a real sense of the kind of projected victimhood of Muslims that would get kind of combined with the victimhood of other communities. Um, you know, in, in the town of Sarajevo itself. There were also other aspects. For example, Italian soldiers were raping Muslim women. 
in 43, and you know, there, so there's lots of different and stories going on where they're they're seeking, and this is kind of coming back to what they want. Right? They want protection, they want power. They're trying to figure out how to kind of reclaim control over over a society that is really spun out of control. Well, I want to thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you all. For being here. Wonderful, thoughtful comments.